Forbes India presents AWS, the Mavericks, in association with Matrix Partners India. Hello and welcome to the Mavericks Founder Chats, a series of conversations from Forbes India presented by AWS in association with Matrix Partners India. Why have we called this show the Mavericks? It's because our guests are thought leaders, the dig digital native entrepreneurs who are willing to break the rules and the status quo to drive change. And in the process solve some of our most pressing problems with tech driven innovations and leadership. Today's Mavericks founder seriously needs little introduction. It wouldn't be unfair to say that he's one of the early, early believers in the Zomato story, a tale into which tens of thousands of investors bought into over the past month. But Sanjeev Bikchandani is much more than the man who wrote Zomato's first check in 2010. He's also the founder of InfoEdge, a pioneer in Indian internet businesses, which got listed on the bosses 15 years back. Today, Nokri, Jeevan Sati, Shiksha, and 99 Acres are some of the marquee brands under the InfoEdge portfolio. In the course of today's conversation, we will trace Sanjeev's journey from the 90s when he founded Nokri to last fortnight Zenith when Zomato was listed and pick his brains on the lessons we can learn on entrepreneurship, innovation, leadership, and mentorship from this amazing journey. Welcome, Sanjeev. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Joining us in this Joining conversation is Sachin Chawla, Sachin head of digital native businesses for India and Southeast Asia at AWS. Sachin will enlighten us on the role of technology in the growth of BNBs, as well as his own insights on leadership and tackling the COVID-19 crisis. Welcome, Sachin. Thanks, Brian. It's a privilege to be here with you and Sanjeev. Let's, let's begin. Let's begin with uh, Sanjeev. And as they say, let's start from the very beginning. In 1990, you quit your job and then you moved to the room above your father's garage. And five years later, we had the internet and two years later, InfoH was born. Right. So how, how did this all happen? I, I mean, and that process since you quit your job till, till the day InfoH was took shape. What, what all happened in that period? Still in some form or the other since 1990, 1990 when I quit my job. Uh, in the beginning, we did salary surveys. We moved on to other reports, uh, some small time consulting services. I mean, basically we teaching, training, some writing. Uh, I would do whatever came my way in order to survive. Right? Uh, and we, we were operating out of the servant quarter above the garage in my father's house. Um, and we were paying him 800 rupees a month rent. And uh, we had bought a some second-hand furniture, one second-hand computer. Computers are expensive in those days. You know, in the, we started off in the beginning without a computer. And I would go to a friend's office at night, just use his computer. Uh, gradually, we began to be able to afford stuff. Uh, and I had no big idea. I had no vision. I didn't. I just didn't want a job in a large corporate sector as a professional manager. I had done that for five years. I said, this is not the life I want. So I quit and I said, that, let me pursue one of those small ideas. And in 97, we launched Nokri, seemingly as one more small idea. So, you know, we had done 20 small ideas. This is the 21st small idea. Um, did we have a vision? No. Uh, we said, that time, there were only 14,000 internet accounts in the country with shared accounts, maybe a couple of hundred thousand users. Uh, but it's a small number. But to me, it looked like a large number in 1997. And uh, we had a very limited goal that if you could get 500 companies every month to pay 1,000 rupees to list one job on the website for, for a month, you would do 5 lakh revenue every month, rupees 5 lakhs, which means you would do 60 lakhs a year. And our company turnover was roughly about maybe 12 lakhs that year. So I said, if you can do this in three years, the company is about 5x. And it looked like a very big, large goal to me. And I said, uh, you know, that will be a huge success if in three years we can reach 60 lakhs. Uh, and, you know, I would have done something significant. And we started off with that goal in mind. Uh, as things happened, right place, right time, worked hard, worked smart, got lucky, internet grew, venture capital came into India, uh, dot-com bubble happened, we got lucky. 
uh, we were able to raise venture capital. Uh, not a lot of money, uh, but by today's standards, but to me, it looked like a huge sum of money. Uh, 7.3 crores we raised from uh, one, at the $1.7 million then, the exchange rate of 40 rupees uh, or thereabouts. And uh, we raised money from ICICI Venture and we diluted 15% of the company. Uh, we got lucky because uh, we raised money only two weeks before the meltdown, the 2000 dot com bust. And because it, we, we just didn't have time to spend the money foolishly. Because if we raise it six months earlier, we would almost certainly spend the money foolishly. So we got lucky. We just put the money in fixed deposit in the bank and uh, he said, you know, tear up the business plan. This is the only, you don't deserve this money. You don't deserve the solution, but now you got it. You got lucky. Uh, just, you got to make it happen in this money. You will never get any further money. So we began to grow the company slowly and uh, didn't spend money on advertising. Just added salespeople, some technology, some servers, some product improvement, uh, made small losses for two years. And then we broke even again uh, at a much, much higher revenue base. And uh, since then, we've been profitable right through and growing. And in 2006, we listed. Along the way, we diversified, invested in other companies, and so on and so forth. But Nokri still is the foundation of this company. Sure. What was the climate for entrepreneurs like then in the 90s? What were the sources of capital you talked about? Yes, ICSA Ventures did exist, but how easy was it to get venture capital? Oh, no, no. When we launched, when, when, when I became an entrepreneur in 1990, uh, we took venture yeah. capital in 2000. Yeah. It took 10 years, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, while ICSA Ventures existed, you know, it was earlier called TDICI. Uh, technically, they did give venture capital, but, you know, I had never, I vaguely heard of venture capital. I didn't know what it was. I had never yeah. met anybody who raised venture capital. And I never met a venture capitalist, right? So there were just two organizations then, or maybe three, that give some small venture capital. There was TDICI, uh, there was SIDBI, and there was uh, GVCL, Gujarat Venture Finance Corporation Limited. All three were government-owned. Because remember, ICICI was largely a government-owned organization for right through the 90s. Yeah, it was a development yeah. institute at that time. Yeah. That's right. It was a DFI. And uh, you... Uh, you know, so it wasn't, I mean, venture capital was not in the consideration set. I remember it took me uh, six months of struggle to get a 30,000 rupee OD limit uh, from a nationalized bank in 92, 1992. And that's because banks would not lend money if you could not give collateral, which basically meant services companies could not get bank finance. So you got to do it with either your own money. I didn't have any money. Uh, my father was the retired doctor from the government. Uh, my mom was a homemaker. Um, so then eventually you had to somehow, uh, you know, get customer advances, live off that, not take your own salary. So I think the first 10 years, uh, I didn't take salary for about six years, you know, from 1990 to 93, I could not take a salary. And 97 to 2000, I could not take a salary. So it was a financially a struggle, right? And uh, yeah. you just kept your costs low, kept your head down, Worked hard and prayed hard. And there were no role models. There was no, none of your friends were in entrepreneurship. Um, you know, in my class in IMA, there were very few entrepreneurs. So, of course, uh, I was not in touch with them anyway. Uh, there was no internet, there was no mobile, there was no nothing. So you plowed a lonely furrow and you, you know, soldiered on and hoped for the best. Right. And how easy was it to form a team and actually to convince people to quit their jobs and, you know, buy into your dream? People must have so look, crazy. Yeah. see, in the first eight or nine years, uh, you essentially hired two kinds of people. People who would not get a job elsewhere and people who are dropouts like me and didn't want to be part of the corporate sector. Right? Okay. Uh, and I did uh, with the people who were expensive resources, people from the IITs and IMs who were dropouts, I would do a revenue share deal, I would do an equity deal. Uh, I could not afford to give a fixed salary. And to the junior staff, you know, they depended on the salary. Uh, so you paid them a fixed salary. Uh, and the fixed salary would be, you know, a few thousand rupees a month uh, because uh, it was the 90s and that was what the salaries were then. Then when the dot-com thing began to get trendy and fashionable and venture capital began to come in, then it got easier. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, but then when the meltdown happened, uh, nobody wanted to come into a dot-com. Yeah. But 
at that time, you know, other dot coms were shutting down and we were still carrying on because we had a revenue model. We were breaking even. We had got some venture capital. You know, we had a possibly we had a future. So we managed to hire talent that was released by other dot coms because they were shutting down and downsizing. So we happened to be the right place, right time, even from a talent perspective. Uh, we did a few things right and uh, we gave equity and uh, we gave a high variable, low fixed, high variable dependent on revenue. But eventually we managed. Okay. So, so what would be that moment, uh, Sanjeev, when you would say that, you know, tech became a serious enabler for Indian businesses. We did have IT services and outsourcing free internet also, and that was really putting India on the global map. But, but when did, you know, technology actually enter people's homes and offices and such people's it, it lives? Wasn't, uh, it wasn't a one day thing. Yeah. It was gradual over the years. But if I look at watershed moments, uh, I would look at uh, the time when the internet went out of the mobile. That was a big moment. Uh, when Geo came in and dropped data prices. Uh, when uh, BSNL came in before that and dropped uh, voice prices. Right. So I remember I got my first mobile phone in 1996. Uh, and it was 16 rupees, 80 paise a minute to make a call. Uh, so a five minute call was 84 rupees. Uh, you know, outgoing and inbound was not free. Right. So, I mean, why do you think Indians invented the, the missed call? It's because of this, uh, this crazy pricing, the 84 rupees for five minute call. Right. It took BSNL and then Reliance to drop voice prices and then ultimately Geo to drop uh, data prices. So I think uh, it was not one day over a period of maybe 10, 12, 15 years, many things began to happen one by one. Sure. Sure. Uh, Right. And uh, so yeah. I think if I look at 10 years ago, 93% of our traffic was on the, from the big screen, the laptop or the desktop. Today, 97% of our traffic is from the mobile. Huge transition. Yeah. I think uh, video on uh, you know, video on internet, video on mobile, audio, these are all big developments. I think local language, I think, uh, you know, local, social, these are all we, things we take for granted now. But when they happen... Each of them was a uh, big, big watershed. Sure. Okay, let me fast forward now to Sachin. Uh, Sachin, in the last one year, we've seen technology actually going to the core of businesses. Actually, you know, I mean, earlier it was an enabler. Now we are seeing it at the core of businesses, which makes a company like yours perhaps the bedrock on which successful businesses are built. So, how is AWS going about innovating and serving the rapidly evolving DNB ecosystem in India? Yeah, sure. You know, first of all, it's. Uh, I just want to say that it's such a fascinating story the way Sanjeev, you know, just articulated. He make it look so simple. I'm sure the it was not as simple, but uh, you know, uh, kudos. We draw a lot of inspiration from people like you. Um, on innovation, uh, Brian, on on on, and how AWS or Amazon innovates. I think it's the difference in our approach. Which makes a difference, which you know really is a differentiator, if I can say. Um, you know, a lot of companies have actually lost the appetite to invent. You know, they would usually go and acquire invention. You know, go and acquire a company if you want to acquire a capability. Uh, for us, it is very different. For us, we like to invent and we like to hire people. You know, we like to hire a certain kind of people called builders, who are always looking at reinventing customer experience, uh, finding flaws and coming back and saying, how can I improve it? And then coming and building you know, services for, for customers. And these are also people who see themselves that you know launching a service or launching a solution is not the end of it. It's actually the start of it. Because from there, you have to keep iterating, keep iterating in. Um, you know, uh, because the customer customer needs keep changing, and you keep it ready, making it, you know, absolutely until it is, you know, best, close to the best. I think the second difference uh, in our approach is not many people would know that ninety percent of our product roadmap actually comes from customers, and ten percent of our roadmap come is actually a strat strategic, you know, interpretation of what customers are telling us. You know, to give you an example, when we launched our first data warehouse, you know, which was Redshift, a petabyte scale data warehouse, um, it was the customers who came and said that, 
you know they were dissatisfied with the current um options available it was hard to work it was costly and that's how we developed that on the other hand the second um, option you know the, the second the 10% which i said is strategic interpretation is when we launched the a service called lambda which is basically a serverless option you know the customer didn't tell us they want that but we interpreted it because they wanted something to run a code you know on a certain threshold you know if this is met i just want to run a code but i don't want to you know take servers and then you know configure them and get all of that you know so we launched lambda and there are hundreds of thousand customers using it so um what's i think that's the the approach is the difference and if you see what started back 2006 with just three services we today have more than 200 services available in the platform which you know not just computer storage but you know things around machine learning ai and analytics and yeah. iot and hybrid and security and so on and so forth so that's the other thing and um, we also innovate at a very fast pace you know if you if you see the number of significant features that we probably launched in 2011 were about 80 significant features or functionalities come 2015 it was more than 700 come 2020 20 it was more than 2700 so you know not only we are just creating more services we are also innovating at a very fast rate at every year you know and that's what has really kept us you know the ability to to work backward from customer knowing what they need you know the ability to hire the people who really like to invent and then you know uh, keep the pace of innovation really really strong um is what has helped us um, you know to meet our customer demand some of the things that we working currently are or you know i would say the areas of uh, um uh, real focus is around machine learning ai iot edge data analytics uh, compute we doing a lot of innovation computers creating our own chips and so on and so forth so yeah so the, the, yeah. The, those will be the things i would say sure Okay, let me take this uh, concept of innovation back to Sanjeev. Sanjeev, uh, perhaps still a couple of uh, decades ago, innovation was something we associated with a handful of sectors like probably pharma and and life sciences and maybe a few MNCs that had their R&D centers in India. Right. So, how has the nature of innovation changed since then, and how how does one go about creating a culture of innovation in an in an organization? So, I just like to echo what. such and said uh uh-huh. you see when we launched nokri for the first three or four years every idea that was implemented was mine right uh, it was a bright idea i had uh, some succeeded some failed but the ones that succeeded then you know did well enough for us to stay afloat and you know eventually become a big company but from the year 2001 onwards see what we did was we hitesh had joined the company and prior to that we were selling a direct mail which basically means you sent out letters and brochures and with forms for jobs and you asked for checks in advance you did not ever actually speak to a customer talk to a customer right right uh in those days you got to understand that uh our customers our users typically did not have an email many did not have a mobile phone so in in companies for example uh, there would be one email address which belonged to the a creature called the edb manager and in dual manager did not have email right so you had to communicate to them with a hard copy letter fax or landline right so we were not really talking to our customers we were this uh, you know little sort of company in transyamana by now we had moved into the second floor of my father's house uh, you know uh, uh, because the servant quarters were too small for us uh, hitesh joined in 2000 uh, just before we raised venture capital and he joined without a role or assignment i had met him and after spending three years with him i said why didn't you join us uh and he said what like do i say i don't know we'll figure it out he came he came on board and uh, after two weeks he sort of told me say listen i've studied the company after two weeks here you don't have anybody looking after sales and marketing may i look after sales and marketing i said sure choose your job and he began to look after sales and marketing he was head of sales and marketing and he after one month into that job he said listen we're selling a direct mail i think it's fine uh, but why don't we hire four sales people 
and make them go out in the market and help face to face. So I said, sure thing, we got venture capital, but then said, one of those little experiments we do. So we hired four salespeople and we sent them out in the market. And we sort of uh, finally began to speak to our customers, our recruiters, because the salesperson was there. Now, what happened was that we discovered that, look, the average salesperson within six months was making sales of 50,000 a month, headed north. Uh, the product had a 90, uh, the product was, I mean, it's a virtual product, so there's no real variable cost. So it was almost all margin. And the total cost of a salesperson, salary, conveyance, um, you know, imputed office rent, uh, air conditioning cost, sharing a computer, the average cost uh, was about uh, 22,000 rupees a month. So the salesperson was making a 28,000 rupee profit on his own total cost. Uh, and this was going north because every month you're selling more and more. So we said, hey, this is pretty cool. We have found what in our company we call a repeatable profitable unit that look, if you got to find a repeatable profitable unit and then you must start repeating it and that's how you scale profitably. So within two years, we had got about 240 salespeople uh, across 11 cities. Now, uh, around the year, maybe 2001, uh, I started a Yahoo group of all the salespeople in our, in our company, along with the senior management and the tech and product guys and the marketing people. Right? And I told the salespeople, this, whatever feedback you get from any sales call, put it on this group. Right? So guys would write, oh, I went to meet this client. This is what he said. This is, this is working. This is not working. Oh, he gave me this idea. So this became this funnel of ideas directly from our clients and users on how to improve the product, right? And suddenly, uh, none of the ideas that being implemented were for me. They were all from customers. It was this hack of a Yahoo group with all the sales guys. They're saying every piece, everything a customer tells you, just put here to share with everybody. It was this hack that, uh, you know, which uh, sort of helped us innovate. So. Today, while look, some uh, innovation may come because you're scanning the environment, because you're studying competition, because you're seeing what new technologies are out there uh, to see what's possible. But a lot of it is coming from customers, exactly as such an important. So the more you talk to customers, the more you listen to customers, the more they will push you and force you to innovating. The more you do that, see a customer tells you what he or she wants. You just implement that, they will keep on buying your product. So customer-led innovation, I think, is perhaps a very good way to innovate, at least in some, at least in some industries. Sure. Okay, let me move to another area that has seen some change, and this is also change driven by courtesy of startups and perhaps even venture capital, and that is leadership. Right? How different would leadership in traditional large companies and conglomerates be from leadership in startups? Right. It would seem that traditional groups have also taken some cues from startups. I remember Anand Mahindra saying a decade ago that he was in the business of entrepreneurship and each of his CEOs were venture capitalists and private equity allocators. Right. So what lessons in leadership do startup founders like you have to offer? Uh, look, uh, in my view, uh, it's easy to say the right things. It's harder to walk the talk. Right. The first thing about uh, Start startups and startup founders, the kind that will go on to raise venture capital and get funded and become large, usually is that it's a very collegial environment where anybody can come and challenge you and you mustn't get hassled. So second is, it's not a family business. It's not as if, you know, your kids can come in and say, okay, now I'll run the business or I'll, you know, it's, not, it's it doesn't happen. So it's genuinely people are there on merit and competence. Yes, somebody may have a higher shareholding because he actually started it, but that doesn't necessarily make him smarter. So the first thing is realization that good ideas can come from anyone or anywhere. Uh, and you can be challenged and you should be open to being challenged. So I've had, uh, you know, trainees walk into my room and say, hey, you said this. Uh, I disagree. I think you're wrong. And it's fine. Okay, because if you don't have that kind of environment genuinely, so the hierarchy cannot be oppressive. So the one thing you never got, you will get sacked for 
in our company is for telling your boss that he or she is wrong. Okay. And there are people who can take that and people who can't take that. And now when you grew, we got lots of people laterally and they brought in their own mindsets and their own cultures from other, other organizations. And some could not handle it. Some could not handle being challenged and therefore they left. So I think the first thing a good startup would have that anybody can challenge anybody. Okay. So the boss isn't always right. Okay, great. Sachin, having worked closely with startups, I'm sure you would have had seen some leadership lessons. Uh, you might have uh, some lessons to share also, and you would have picked up some lessons. Right. So from your vantage point at AWS, how would you see the role of a leader in today's times? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I totally echo what Sanjeev said. And, um, you know, a, a leader in today's time is, you know, today's time has changed. If, if you go back 10 years back and you compare to, you know, now, one of the things that has changed is just the, if, if you're a startup, you know, the velocity of decisions that you have to make is so fast and so high um, that you really need to take a decision as soon as possible, you know, sometimes with 70% of the data, you know, and sometimes with, you know, you may have 100% data, sometimes you may not. Um, you know, in, in Amazon, we have this concept, which is, uh, as you, you know, decision making where we call a one way door, door or a two way door, you know, you differentiate between a one way door and a two way door. Uh, a one way door is something which you can quickly take a decision, experiment, see if it works. If not, it's you can come back and reverse. And that's, that's you know, one-way door is like a reversible decision. Sorry, two-way door is a reversible decision. And a one-way door is not a reversible decision, which means once you've gone in, the impact of it is very high and you can't come back. So um, I I have seen that getting practiced in a lot of startups now, you know, the customer, where the leaders are really... Uh, differentiating a one-way door versus two-way door and saying which one has a high impact, which one is, you know, we can just stick and, and just move on. The second thing is, um, you know, the boardroom is totally evolved from what it was before and what it is now, you know. Um, this is really a digital boardroom. Uh, the playbooks have totally changed, you know. You don't, um, you know, with, with the invention of cloud and, you know, you have everything as OPEX, you can do multiple experiments, you can fail, the cost of experiment is low. So the playbook has changed to to really experiment more and more, see what sticks, um, get a minimum viable product out, get the customer feedback, iterate from it, and keep moving on. Uh, vis what it was, you know, uh, ten years back, uh, uh, you know, when internet was just it just evolving. Right. So um, I think it's all about making high velocity decisions. Uh, sometimes you will have the data, sometimes you're not. You differentiate and you move on and you trade and, and keep moving forward. Okay, great. Okay, let me shift gears a bit here. Yeah. And uh, Sanjeev, maybe we could talk about, you know, I mean, what does it take to, you know, make your company, uh, take your company public actually? And you you took InfoEdge public in, way back in 2006. And if I'm not mistaken, you were India's first internet company to be listed domestically. Right. I mean, that would be, that's, that's something. So what was the reaction of, you know, the iBankers and merchant bankers at that time when you first pitched the idea. If you no, actually, I didn't pitch the idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think the IPO machine is a relentless hungry machine. Right? right. Uh, so we got a visit. See, look, the IPO was a dream. The IPO was a quite distant dream. Kabi karenge. We lose some time. Mm -hmm. I had told ICIC when they came in, look, I'm not interested in strategic sale. It'll, it'll go public. Uh, and that's the only exit we'll get. And uh, they somehow came in anyway, because when, a, when an entrepreneur says that, people get worried that, look, if he, he will not sell to somebody else to give us an exit if he can't go public. Uh, now, we sort of uh, went through the meltdown, we became profitable, we were still small, but we kept growing. Then one day around uh, end of 2004, early 2005, we got a visit from a banker, a banker friend of mine who was visiting Hong Kong. And he said, you know, number one uh, job site in China has gone public. We think it could be time for you to go public as well. You're number one job site in India. Now, he planted the seed in our head that, look, maybe the time has come. 
Okay. So under his tutelage, we visited Hong Kong. We met investors. We met, uh, you know, uh, saw the, saw the men, men, you know, met his analysts, met a few people, uh, talked to some lawyers and so on and so forth. And we came back convinced that it's possible. Right? And we went to our board and I, I see as I venture and said, listen, uh, maybe it's time. And we began work in earnest on preparing for an IPO. We staffed up the, the, the finance team. We staffed up the secretarial team. Uh, you know, I got ready to sort of uh, delegate a lot more. Hitesh was called CEO, but he would became de facto CEO in a couple, you know, before just before the IPO, de facto, right? Without getting the title immediately. Uh, and I and uh, the CFO spent a lot of our time working on the IPO. Uh, we hired bankers, but even so, it took us 11 months to put everything ship shape, your systems, ERP, secretarial compliances. Uh, SEBI clearances, uh, auditor sign-offs, all of that took 11 months, uh, you know, and uh, it was not easy. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's become, uh, companies can do it faster now, but it took us a long, long time. So we began to talk about it in February 2005, we went public in October 2006. It was a, the IPO itself was a huge project. Uh, but, but finally we managed and we went public. It was a successful issue. We were oversubscribed some 55 times. Uh, which then was some sort of record, but it was meeting quite quickly. Uh, went public, uh, you know, share price appreciated. Uh, we were walking on air, felt good. And then the global financial crisis hit and our stock price tumbled 75% over a period of three, four months. Uh, went through that and came back up again. And uh, yeah, life goes on. <laughs> How would you contrast that experience with the experience in the run up to the Zomato listing? Um, so I think, look, each uh, era has its own challenges. Uh, yeah. The had different challenges. You're taking a company that's not yet making profit in a market like India. Uh, so here's something that most people don't know. Uh, Zomato had a clear offer to list in the US with substantial financial inducement to Dipinder Royal as the main founder to take that call. He was going to get a very sweet deal. Uh, and he sat and talked about it to us. And finally, he took the call and said, I will list in India, even though it was personally, financially not as lucrative for him. Right? So it was a, a decision, you know, a SPAC may have been faster, a SPAC may have given him more money personally. Uh, but he took the call to list here. I think a very correct, ethical and brave decision uh -huh. uh, to walk away from the personal financial reward. Uh, and I really admire him for that decision. Uh, and they listed in India, the tougher road. It was not clear what would happen in the aftermarket. There was enough doubt, doubt, doubters. I mean, even now, enough people are saying, hey, what is what is this? We don't understand it. Right? But the market's taken very well. I think the response to the IPO was very, very good. The response in the retail segment was unprecedented. So we got feedback from online brokerages that, you know, we have had a record number of new account openings. So basically what happened was that people who never invested in the stock market earlier, but were millennials and were perhaps Zomato customers, took the trouble to open their DMAT account and say, hey, this is my company. And they invested for the first time in the stock market. Right? So I think, uh, I, I think the impact of Zomato is uh, truly something else. Uh, the impact of Zomato listing is truly something else. Uh, more importantly, it has shown the way for all other startups that they said, all this stuff which investors tell you, hey, why don't you flip your company overseas? We put in money, we, you grow, uh, you know, and then we list you overseas. Uh, that is not required. That is a myth. That is what investors say because it's convenient for them. Uh, but it's the wrong decision for most entrepreneurs. If your market is in India, uh, your operations are in India, why on earth should you be domiciled overseas? And why on earth should you flip? You are getting to regulatory complexities you don't understand. After a few years, the investor will exit, but you will be holding a flipped company uh, forever with all the attendant regulatory complexities. Sure. sure. Okay, but but still, I guess uh, when it comes to a phenomenal business model, it would seem that there's nothing like Nokri, right? And, and and the kind of amazing profit margins that it churns out. Can you can you tell us what really makes it so unique? And and also, you know, the kind of competition that you had to battle in the early days, you had monster jobsahead.com, I think. 
they were the same thing right and and a yes. couple of other formidable fours so and and i think you kind of put it across them and and really emerged so look, uh, a tough period yeah look, sure okay so here's what i like to say successful businesses are built on deep customer insights So when I was in my last job in HMM, which is now called Lexus like, Script Line, there used to be seven or eight of us who used to sit in an open hall. All were from the IIMs or the good MBA schools. Uh, HMM was a multinational, a prestigious company, handling good brands. So this is a good talent pool. Uh, and I used to observe a very strange thing that every time the office copy of Business India would come in, everybody would read it from the back. Because in those days, there were 35 to 40 pages of appointment ads in the back of Business India. So people yeah. would not read the articles, they'd read, they'd read the ads and pass on the magazine. And they would start discussing that, hey, there's this job going here, job going there, what do you think? Now, these are talented guys who are in a multinational. This is pre-liberalization. So if you wanted marketing, not sales, which means head office, you wanted Delhi. That means you wanted a company with head office in Delhi. You wanted FMCG. Right? Uh, there were just two companies, Nestle and HMM, and they would not hire from each other. So you would you were already in the best job you could be in. And the company had good brands, it paid well. There was no reason to be unhappy. Yet people would talk about jobs all the time and look at job ads. And I found this very strange behavior. And I said to myself, my God, jobs are a, such a high interest category of information that even if you are not looking for a job, you look at a job. So insight number one. Insight number two is that because it was an open hall, I could see and hear other, my colleagues talk on the phone. And I realized every week there would be two or three different, uh, uh, two or three of my colleagues would get calls from headhunters, uh, offering them a job and uh, calling them for an interview. And every time it was a different job in a different company and these jobs were not advertised. So I got second insight that, listen, there's a massive, massive, massive number of jobs out there which are not advertised. What appears in print is the tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, and therefore, if somebody were to build a database of jobs and keep it live and current, um, you know, it would be a very powerful product. People will find, find, it, find it useful, right? Uh, and I didn't know what to do with this insight, but seven years later, when I saw the internet, we launched Opry based on these two insights. And Essentially, insight was that if you aggregate jobs, you'll get traffic because it's a high interest category of information. So we just got 29 newspapers and magazines around the country into office every week and just would take all the jobs and rehash it and put it on the net. And traffic began to come. Once traffic came, we began to get inquiries from companies that, listen, I haven't advertised in the print, in the newspaper, but can I send you a job? You put it up. And we said, sure, pay us money. And we got a revenue model. And that's how it happened. But it all happened from the customer insight. So then we realized that, listen, uh, we are sitting on a, a, a variant of the network effect, which I will call a virtuous circle. We've got the most jobs. Therefore, we get the most traffic. We get the most traffic. Therefore, we get the most response. We get the most response. Therefore, we get the most clients. We get the most clients. Therefore, we get the most jobs. It snowballs. Right. This is our moat. Right? Now, when jobs right. had launched and competition came, we did not have the customer insight that job aggregation will lead to traffic. So when they launched, we had we had we were taking jobs free from newspapers. We were saying single single job listing 350 rupees. We were saying annual subscription six thousand rupees. All the jobs for you have in your company for one year, you can keep on putting it up six thousand rupees a year. That's it. So our entire pricing strategy was built to aggregate jobs. When competition launched, they priced single job listing 3,500 rupees. They were comparing it to display ads in time zone to ascent. We were simply saying aggregate jobs. Now, without that insight, they would not get enough jobs because they priced it wrong. You don't get enough jobs, you don't get enough traffic. So you do, that flywheel, that virtue circle does not work. So successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Our moat is built on our virtue circle. And which is a manifestation of the network effect in our business. 
And because we have that moat, we get the most revenue, we get the most profit, we're able to reinvest that profit further into product improvement, into technology, into more salespeople, better servicing, advertising brand, and, and so on. So our position becomes stronger. And that's how it worked. Awesome. Okay. Okay, Sachin, uh, coming back to you, uh, this one question on, you know, uh, comparison from the early days of the internet, when companies like Invoyage were founded, how is the landscape of founding and building internet businesses changed from the point of view of new technologies like cloud that have emerged yeah. and give companies a competitive advantage, right? So, so how has that landscape actually changed? Yeah, I think uh, Sanjeev also earlier touched upon this. A number of things have changed. Uh, if you if you go back a few, you know, like a decade, more than a decade back now. So, uh, you know, if you look at the demand side, the penetration of internet the smartphone and the and use you know usage of smartphone um, has really um, opened the floodgates on the demand but on the supply side when I you know I say supply technology because technology has also really evolved uh, and all you know and cloud has totally changed the game right because if you if you were uh, and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure Sanjeev would agree with me if you go back you know 15, 20 years back, if you were to be an entrepreneur, you start something, you know, all you have to do, you know, you'll have to invest all the money in CapEx, which means you needed that money from somewhere. There's no OPEX option. Um, so uh, one is that. So once, even if you invested in it, you know, post that, uh, going to market is not going to be as fast as it is right now because, you know, you don't have all the solutions and, you know, you'll have to go and buy solutions, keep integrating them of that the go to market was slow uh, you can't iterate fast you know uh, you also have to go the the ability to go fast was not dependent on you know just the demand it was also dependent on how fast can you go you know the playbook has totally changed with cloud coming in you know the moment you go from capex to opex um, you see you suddenly see so many entrepreneurs right? so many people going and trying new ideas which you could have that could not have done earlier because uh, the the Barriers to entry, you know, the entry barrier is so so high because of cost. Now, you know, as I said, the it's it's all about you can experiment more. You can see which one sticks. You can build models. You can see if it, it's going to work or not. Um, and the the cost of experimentation for building that is really really low. So, um, I think that is one. The second is, uh, you know, the new technologies that have come up. You know, technology around machine learning, AI. Um, or, you know, use of data, um, all of that has also matured in the last five years, you know, a lot. And uh, today, if you are on cloud, you have so, you know, you have everything that you need to build and build, you know, if you want to build a machine learning company, all those, uh, you know, different options are available to you. If you want to build something on IoT, all of that is available to you. So you really don't have to go anywhere. All you need to do is sort out your business model, you know, what you want to build, you know, look at the customer's work backward, really focus on your core and not worry about all the heavy lifting you're doing technology. I think that is changed the game and, you know, that's why you see so many new companies, new ideas, uh, people coming and solving those problems uh, for customers. Sure. Okay, at this point, I'll, I'll just request the audience to send in your questions uh, for Sanjeev and Sachin. So, uh, Please, please uh, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, we'll have a audience round uh, soon in about 10 to 15 minutes. Right. So uh, for now, uh, continuing, Sanjeev, with your journey, I think after InfoH was listed a few years after that, we had the 2008 crisis. And maybe a couple of years after that, you you actually started uh, spotting you know, exciting businesses and ex exciting entrepreneurs that you would want to work along with. Like besides Dipinder, there was also Yashish the year of uh, Policy Bazaar, right? So, so when did that transition happen, and what made you put, what persuaded you to kind of start investing in uh, such startups? See, the company we had listed, the company was running, uh, and increasingly Hitesh was running it. Although I still had the title of CEO, but more and more Hitesh was uh, running the entire operations. You know, yeah, HR reported to me directly, finance reported directly, a couple of people reported directly, but by and large, it was Hitesh. So it's only a matter of time where we formalize the arrangement uh, where Hitesh would be CEO and, uh, you know, I would be unemployed. Hmm. Okay. Uh, 
and we had this money sloshing around the bank, uh, which we raised. And the company was highly profitable. It didn't. It couldn't absorb the money we raised. Uh, and we figured that maybe, look, we should acquire somebody. So we went to the market and we found that nobody was acquiring. And if there was anybody, it was too expensive. So we said, let's take a you know, couple of small experiments. And in 2007, we invested in one company. 2008, we invested in two or three companies and so on. Um, you know, and in 2008, we invested in, in, uh, in Policy Bazaar. In 2010, I formally stepped aside as CEO and Hitesh became CEO. Okay. Uh, and I was then handling board matters, some uh, COPGAV issues, some media, some government interactions, some industry forums, and you know, investor relations and uh, uh, investments. Now, it started off as a small cottage sector activity, you know, but over time, it sort of became larger and larger. And as now, the truth is that. Uh, you know, investing is a business where the lemons ripen early. So, if it's blowout, then it's over two, three years. In mean, two, three years, you get your blowouts. But to succeed, and call something a success, it takes six, seven, eight years. You're never sure. Right? So, there was a period in the middle, 2012 to 15, where we did not invest in a single new company. Because the board was saying, man, you've deployed 160 crores. What's come out of it? And three have blown up. So we waited and watched. 2015, we had to invest again in new companies. Okay. Uh, because by then, it was getting somewhat clear, you know, Zavato and Policy Bazaar may be breakout successes. Maybe, maybe. Not sure, but okay. We are confident enough. We paused for three years. Let's start investing again. So it was, uh, again, you know, put your toe in the water, do a few small deals, uh, figure it out. Uh, okay, now take a breather, stop for three years. Uh, okay, now we're more confident. Let's put in some more money. And so that's how it happened, actually. So it was like a startup within the larger company, company. Right. Okay. And, and, and did, did you have a checklist of sorts that... Uh, what are the companies that you would uh, invest in? I mean, what would you look for rather in, in, in companies? Yeah, you know, in the beginning, we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants using our common sense. Uh, I didn't have investing experience. Nobody in my team had investing experience. So all through, uh, our investing team has never had investing experience outside our company. So we are homegrown talent. I think two years ago, uh, we got on board one person who had been an investor somewhere else. But otherwise, we have been learning by doing, uh, and we formed our mm -hmm. own heuristics, formed our own uh, sort of evaluation parameters, uh, and have moved on, uh, and it's worked for us. Right. So we are not these guys who chase an IRR. Uh, we are not these guys who say, you know, sat sal me kitna hoga, no sal me kitna hoga, and so on and so forth. We just back good business, good guy, people who we think are good, doing good work. Now, how do we assess who is good, and how do we assess, uh, you know, what is good work? I think one key thing that we have learned from our own experience is uh, if you uh, if if the if the offering, if the site, if the app is getting natural traction, which means it's getting visitors without spending money on marketing, and these visitors are growing, it means that it's onto something. So let's take the case of Zomato. It was then called Foodie Bay. And I was using the site, Hitesh was using the site independently, and we loved it. So one day Hitesh told me, have you seen the site Foodie Bay? I said, yes, of course, I use it all the time. He says, isn't it great? I said, yes. He says, why aren't you considering for investment? And I said, yeah, why not, man? It never occurred to me. So I went on to uh, Network Solutions. I did a Who is Search. I found Foodie Bay. The admin contact is a guy called Dipinder Goyal. Uh, I did a Google search on Dipinder Goyal. I found an email ID somewhere. I sent him a cold email, June 2010. I said, Dear Dipinder, uh, are you the same person who done Foodie Bay? If so, fantastic work. Congratulations. Uh, this is my mobile number. They send me a mail or contact me. Uh, I want to have a chat. Right? Now, Dipinder did not know who I was and he saw my email ID. He said, Oh, he's a knockery salesperson. He's trying to sell me a <laughs> knockery product. So he didn't get back to me. After two days, he did a Google search and he says, hey, no, no, he's the CEO of Nopri. And he reached out to me and he came and met me. Right? And I asked him a question. 
where did you get this idea from? The idea kahan se aaya? It would be a fascinating story. He said, I was working in Bain Consulting and uh, office in Gurgaon, maybe 50, 60 people, mostly young, mostly male. Long working hours, you ended up having two meals in office. People do not get food from home. Young, male, single, living away from home very often. Wouldn't get food from home. Often at a cafeteria, they would not serve food. But you could bring your own food and eat it. So to make life easy for the employees, the admin guys had collected delivery menu cards of roughly 80 restaurants that would deliver to a location and put them in two file folders. And Deepinda said, you know, at one o'clock, it's a huge problem because, you know, people would queue up for those file folders. You get it for 30 seconds, you make a call decision and you call up the restaurant and then you order and food comes after one hour. Huge pain. He came in one Saturday and just scanned all these menu cards and uploaded them on his own personal page in the office internet. And he says, within two days, the IT infra guy came to me and said, man, what have you done? Why is all the internal traffic going to your page? He said, penny dropped in my head. And I figured that, man, it's not just my problem. It's everyone's problem. So he figured, just like I had understood 10, 12 years ago, that, uh, you know, aggregation of jobs has value. He figured aggregation of menu cards has got value. And he began to go out on weekends just picking up menu cards from restaurants all over Delhi and CR. When he had 800, he launched a site, Foodie Bay. Uh, restaurant information, menu card. And it immediately began to get traffic, including from me. And so he figured you're onto something. So if the site is getting natural traction, you've got a hot button, you're solving an unsolved problem, you've got a customer insight. Right? So a very important sort of thing we look at is natural traction. Very important question we ask is, where did you get the idea from? The idea can say And the answer to that tells us a lot. Yeah. Okay. So one is yeah. one is yeah. that. The second question we ask is after we fund you, what is the salary you want to pay yourself? We're not interested in the answer. We're interested in how he thinks about the answer. He or she. Right. And I won't bore you with the details, but it tells us a lot about the person, his motivation, his goals, his objectives. You say, Kate, Niyat in Hindi. Yeah. Right? And that tells a lot about the guy or the girl. Sure. Okay, a couple of questions come in from uh, the audience. Uh, there's Surabhi Gulati Gupta who was asked uh, In a highly competitive digital market with minimal entry barriers, what should a startup focus on? Product innovation or product awareness? That's an interesting question. Sachin, you want to go first? Uh, I, I can take a take a stab uh, at it. Um, my opinion, I think it's both. I don't think it's a either or choice. Uh, you know, product awareness. Uh, you already have something, and you, as I said, it's just a starting line. Customer need will keep changing, so you'll have to have the product awareness to keep iterating the product to stay um, relevant to the customer. Uh, product innovation, what Sanjeev said, right, or Sanjeev's you know story. Uh, that you you go and you do multiple experiments, do 20 of it, 19 will fail, but one will be worth enough to, uh, you know, for a chart. So uh, you got to keep doing both uh, to, to stay relevant and if, uh, and move forward. And if no, I'll say the same thing. I'll say the same thing. But I will just add a little twist. You focus on one thing, the customer, right? Uh, if you focus on the customer, you would innovate relevant to the customer. And you make the customer more aware. So both are actually around the customer. Sure. Okay, another slightly uh, different question. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, what does it mean to be a billionaire? And it's not that you became a billionaire with Zomato. I mean, you became a billionaire with uh, InfoH, I think, last year, at least according to the Forbes list. Right. So what does wealth mean to you? And, and, and when you set out, I mean, you keep saying we got lucky, but uh, I mean, we're sure there's much more to that. But now that you are in the possession of this wealth, what, what does it mean to you? And and where do you see yourself going for uh, with this wealth? I mean, what would be your passion from here on? So, first of all, it is embarrassing when people discuss this topic with you. Uh, yeah. Second, there's always a doubt, do I deserve it? Third, you know, uh, just want to figure out that, listen, this is not your wealth. You are a custodian of this. And there is also the imperative that, listen, you need institutional stability which basically means 
you can't actually sell it. So, you know, what Forbes does, other people do, they take the public listed companies, take the promoter shareholding, multiply it by the price, and say, this guy's worth so much. But if the guy actually sells it, you know, uh, the price will tank, and nobody actually sells it. It's like, it's like look, it's a, you, you're living in a house which your father bought in the 60s. You're living in the house. Now, technically, you say, hey, it's worth 25 crores now. But actually, you're never going to sell it. You're living there. What you do do, however, is you try and do good stuff with at least some of the wealth, which means you start giving back. And which is what sort of I have been doing in a small way. You know, Ashoka University, maybe 10, 15, 20 other uh, charities you've been supporting, apart from the company's ASR. Uh, and uh, you move on. Okay. So sure. my lifestyle hasn't really changed uh, a lot. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, you know. Yeah, okay. Uh, Arthik Dave wants to know how does Sanjeev sir see the financial inclusion in India? I mean, it's a slightly off the cuff question, but uh, do you want to take it? Yeah, I'll take it. So, look, I think it's uh, there's been substantial progress because of India going digital, because of the mobile phone, because of Jandan account, because of uh, you know, Aadhaar, UPI. And I think uh, companies like, like Amazon, Google, Paytm, uh, you know, uh, Facebook, they're all at the center of it. Okay. And it'll get, I think, uh, digital technology will make it, make uh, financial inclusion, uh, you know, more ubiquitous and there'll be more and more people being brought into the ambit. Right. But look, is India, does India still have massive, massive, massive financial income inequality? Yes, it does. Uh, if we do grow fast, uh, chances are, so if you look at the Gini coefficient, you know, in societies and economies where which grow fast, you know, inequalities go up first. But as long as the bottom is also being lifted and benefited, you live with that increase in inequality. And over time, maybe, then the Gini coefficient will go down. Sure. Okay. The question's pouring in now. I think this is a good one. Uh, what is some uh, Surabi asks this? What is the one must-have criteria for a startup to have to have a check on to win investment from InfoAge? Uh -huh. Oh boy. <laughs> Look, there are three or four things uh, that will make or break a, a startup, according to us. So, number one, uh, do you have natural traction? Are you solving an unsolved problem? Have you hit a hot button? Are you, does the customer want what you're selling? Right? Now, to do all that, you usually have to innovate. You have to be a pioneer. You have to be relevant. You have to be different. Right? So that's one set of criteria. The other are related to uh, the founders. How committed are you? How capable are you? Are you the kind of person who will stay the... See, typically it takes 10, 15, 20 years to really build a good big company. Along the way, there'll be lots of challenges. Uh, supposing you don't raise money, supposing you get some money, but then the second round doesn't come in. Do you have what it takes to hang on in there? How committed are you? How capable are you? Are you the kind of person who is a natural magnet for talent? Will people want to work with you? Will you treat your minority shareholders well? Uh, today you've got eight people in a team, but can I visualize you tomorrow five years out, can this person uh, manage a team of 3,000 people? Should it, they have a team of 3,000 people? So how good a people's person are you? Uh, so these, I mean, now to succeed an entrepreneur needs 100 different qualities. Uh, nobody has all of them. But do you have enough of the big ones as a person? Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Do you think the current valuations of uh, new age internet startups are justified? even after accounting for operating leverage? This is asked by Niji Razda. So look, uh, it's a tough one, right? Uh, see, we don't uh, decide the valuations, <laughs> at least not the public market valuations. The, the market decides it. We only run the business. Uh, our share price was 2,100 rupees uh, maybe a year and a half ago. It's now over 5,000. Is that justified? I don't know. If the market is saying it is, it is. 
tomorrow if the market corrects the valuation goes down then that valuation is justified so the valuation that is justified is the valuation that's in the market today because somebody is paying it right uh, now you may or may not want to pay that valuation so you may or may not buy at that price that's your call but we just run the business so valuation goes up we run the business valuation goes down we run the business valuation case goes sideways we run the business that's all entrepreneurs do they just run the business they do not figure out the valuations okay uh, one last question and i think we'll call it uh, a day then how do you get wealthy without being lucky ask kaurush pandit look you got to be lucky i mean in a sense you got to be good hard working persistent and lucky right almost if you ask any entrepreneur were you lucky he'll say yes i was lucky but i also worked hard i also worked smart i knew my customer and i persisted so you know um, i have a friend a close friend from school and college a guy called nirin chaudhry he used to head uh, kfc and yum brand in, in india until a few years back now he's located overseas uh, and he had called me for a talk in his company and uh, i said i got lucky and at the end of that talk when he was sum- summarizing he said look sanjeev is saying you're lucky but i tell you something about luck and this is a profound statement he said look there are many definitions of luck but one definition is uh luck is about being in the right place at the right time right but if you're in enough places enough times for long enough sooner or later you'll be in the right place at the right time so right. persist and try hard don't give up excellent awesome thanks sanjeev and i think on that note we'll end this absolutely fascinating conversation i i i mean I, i know it's a cliche that we often say but this time i mean it and i really wish we could go on and on but we have to wrap it up here so thanks uh, sachin and thanks sanjeev it's been a absolute pleasure to be doing this thank you so much thank you so much yeah and all the best thanks man bye brian bye sachin nice meeting you guys bye, bye. Forbes India presents AWS The Mavericks in association with Matrix Partners India.